cryogenics, a word commonly saved for science fiction tales and frozen celebrities. Today, this technology of reducing gases to cooled, liquefied temperatures provides for their safe and efficient storage and handling. Chart Industries is a global leader in the design, manufacture, and distribution of cryogenic equipment. Our products are critical components in the separation, liquefaction, and processing of industrial gases. The design and operation of cryogenic equipment is fundamental to the safe delivery and end use of the gases across industry. The goal of this presentation is to help develop your understanding of the key concepts of cryogenics, as well as the principles of thermodynamics that make it all possible. Whether or not your future includes the design or the operation of cryogenic equipment, learning the how behind this technology will be beneficial. Let's start with the basics. What is cryogenics? By its technical definition in Webster's Dictionary, cryogenics is a branch of physics dealing with the effect and production of very low temperatures. Scientists consider low to be anything less than negative 238 degrees Fahrenheit. So why exactly does this make handling gas more efficient? Cryogenic temperatures allows us to store and handle atmospheric gases at pressures that keep them in a more compact liquid state. In fact, in its liquid state, the molecules occupy as little as 1 800th of the volume of the gas state. This drastic volumetric difference makes the delivery, pumping, and use of a product much more efficient. We begin with a few principles of thermodynamics, or the study of energy's effect on the state of a fluid. In cryogenics, knowing these effects is critical to understanding why fluids behave the way they do. Here is a fluid system that has liquid with vapor above it. It is useful to consider a fluid system as a collection of liquid and of vapor molecules. Each molecule carries energy and moves through space until it collides with the container wall or another molecule. Let's look more closely at the fluid interface between the liquid and vapor molecules. In this fluid system, we see molecules in the vapor phase and molecules in the liquid phase. The energy level in the liquid phase is much lower than in the vapor phase and is accordingly shown as moving slower than the vapor molecules. The representation of the liquid surface in this model shows gas molecules colliding with the liquid molecules at that surface level. The higher density a liquid has, the more molecules at the liquid surface there are at any given time. The kinetic energy, or speed of the molecules, ensures that these molecular collisions continue to occur, which keep the liquid in the liquid state and the vapor in a vapor state. Since these collisions are equal, we say this system is in thermodynamic equilibrium. If the energy in this system is increased and the system is to remain in equilibrium, the liquid molecules require a larger space for their motion. This larger space reduces the molecular density of the liquid, and we observe liquid growth. Real fluid systems are only very rarely in true equilibrium. If the liquid energy requires more gas collisions at the liquid surface than the vapor can support, those liquid molecules are forced to transition into the vapor phase. This transition is more commonly referred to as evaporation. Should the energy state of the vapor side demand more collisions at the liquid surface than the liquid molecules can provide, then those vapor molecules transition to liquid phase. This transition is referred to as condensation. Understanding the equilibrium energy state where molecules tend to change phase is critical to understanding cryogenic fluid behavior. An equilibrium or saturated energy state has a specific pressure and temperature associated with it. This is called a saturation pressure or saturation temperature. Although assessing the saturation state can be accomplished by measuring temperature, the most convenient property for measurement is typically the fluid pressure. If a substance is saturated at a pressure lower than the actual vapor pressure, no evaporation occurs. In this case, the liquid is often referred to as being subcooled. Such a liquid has the capacity to absorb heat energy or to accommodate reductions in vapor pressure above the liquid without turning into a vapor. 
If the energy of liquid molecules are increased without the increase in pressure to the saturation pressure, those molecules change to a vapor and rise from within the liquid as a vapor bubble. This is called boiling. If the liquid is saturated and the vapor pressure above the surface is quickly reduced below its saturation pressure, the liquid will also begin to boil. Such an automatic boiling event is called flashing. Should the liquid level in a cryogenic system be high enough, flash boiling could lead to two-phase product flowing into a venting pipe. This is known as entrainment. In such a case, there can be an increase in the mass exiting the system. However, the presence of two-phase fluid exiting a pipe is not necessarily abnormal. As mentioned, a cryogenic fluid system is rarely in thermodynamic equilibrium. Heat leaks into the system through the walls of the container, as well as through other contact points. We already discussed that heat energy will decrease the fluid density locally at the wall of the container. This lower density fluid will become buoyant relative to the colder mass of fluid near the inside of the container. This buoyancy will cause the fluid to rise along the wall of the tank and collect at the top. This convection occurs in both the liquid and vapor phase of the fluid system. The uneven distribution of heat in the system is called stratification. Because of stratification, the pressure in stationary cryogenic fluid systems will rise faster than if the energy is distributed evenly. Cryogenic systems that are in motion tend to stir the fluids, which can offset tendencies to stratify. Stratification will tend to keep liquids at some level of subcool. There is always a liquid vapor interface that approaches equilibrium. Now that we have covered and discussed the following concepts equilibrium, liquid growth, evaporation, boiling, condensation, saturation, subcool, flashing, entrainment, and stratification. We have a solid foundation on which to build our understanding of cryogenic equipment. Let's follow the flow of cryogenic liquid as it fills, is stored, and then delivered from a cryogenic tank. A cryogenic tank uses its internal pressure to push gas to a customer's application. The refilling of a tank should not require that the flow to the customer's application is interrupted. As such, the pressure of the tank must be maintained. There are two methods that can be used, top filling and bottom filling. Top filling introduces the cold liquid into the vapor space of the tank. Introducing the cold cryogenic liquid this way actually condenses the warm vapor at the top of the tank. When this condensation of vapor occurs, the pressure begins to fall. It is the fastest and most common method of filling a tank. Bottom filling introduces liquid into a tank from the bottom. Unlike the top filling method, bottom filling compresses the vapor above the tank's liquid level, causing the inside pressure to rise. This is because the vaporized molecules of the product have the same amount of energy but lose space to occupy. Maintaining a constant pressure and temperature inside the tank is crucial when filling. This is achieved by simultaneously top and bottom filling the unit. Just as a sink uses hot and cold faucets to guide the water to a desired temperature, operators use top and bottom filling together to raise and lower the tank pressure to a favorable value. Because we cannot see directly inside of a cryogenic tank, we must use other methods to determine the level of the fluid. Inside of a tank, the pressure drives a differential pressure gauge which is used to estimate the approximate liquid level of the product. The differential pressure gauge works by showing the pressure difference between the vapor space in the tank and the bottom of the tank. The differential pressure gauge derives its liquid level measurements from the liquid's density. This is why liquid level charts lack precision. The differential pressure remains largely unchanged, but liquid growth makes the actual liquid gallons in the tank a function of saturation levels there are temperature and density changes that occur in the product that must be accounted for. The fluid inside the tank slowly warms over time and the liquid level expands. This extra vapor space is called the ullage space. 
the tank has a tricoque overflow valve. This valve will inform the driver filling the tank if the liquid level is exceeding the safe fill level. As we noted when filling the tank, simultaneous top and bottom filling maintains a constant pressure inside the vessel. How is a constant pressure maintained when liquid is used and removed from the tank? This is done through the use of pressure building circuits. As liquid is removed, the pressure building circuit, also known as a PB circuit, replaces the volume of the liquid lost with the gas at the same pressure. When the pressure is low enough to open the PB regulator, weight of the liquid drives fluid out of the tank and through an ambient air heat exchanger, or PB coil. The PB coil adds heat to the liquid, boiling it into a vapor. Liquid head continues to push the vapor into the top of the tank. The pressure building circuit thus raises the tank pressure until the pressure regulator automatically closes. Cryogenic tanks are specifically engineered to prevent heat transfer with the surroundings. However, it is impossible to completely block all of the heat leak. To report how efficiently a cryogenic storage system is insulated from heat transfer, we use a value known as the normal evaporation rate, or NER. Typically given in percent per day loss rate, NER is sometimes given in direct heat transfer rates of BTU per hour, or watts. NER is a performance consideration that must be balanced against product and withdrawal rates. If use rates are too low, the heat from the NER will cause heat and pressure to build up in the tank. To control this heat transfer, Chart uses a proprietary multi-layered super insulation system. Cryogenic tanks are suspended inside vacuum insulation jackets. This suspension minimizes heat paths from supports and piping in contact with both the ambient world and the cryogenic vessel. The insulation system is then evacuated, removing air that can cause additional heat paths to the pressure vessel. Although these highly specialized insulation processes have greatly reduced heat leak in Chark products, it is impossible to stop all transfer from occurring. So what happens to the tank when this heat inevitably leaks inside? Over time, the tank will increase in pressure and the temperature of the liquid will rise. To protect against overpressurization and product loss, Economizer circuits remove pressure from the tank as it surpasses a safe level. This circuit withdraws the vapor phase product to the end use instead of liquid to achieve depressurization. This excess vapor is driven through the circuit by the pressure difference generated in the circuit's piping configuration. As a customer uses the product and it exits the tank, the pressure inside falls, leading to the issue of underpressurization. When this occurs, the pressure building circuit reopens to maintain a useful pressure. The many steps taken to maintain proper tank temperature and pressure may seem cumbersome and tedious at first glance. However, heat management is a vital part to any efficient and effective cryogenic system and cannot be ignored. We've now filled our tank and made sure that it is at proper liquid and pressure levels. What comes next? Well, Let's go over some of the possible uses for the product inside. Although it is stored as a liquid, many of our customers use the fluid in its gaseous form. Whether it is a hospital converting liquid oxygen back to a gas for a patient in need, or a restaurant carbonating their fountain drinks, countless customers rely on Chart's products to ensure reliable and consistent performance for their specific applications. In order to provide users with a gaseous product, we must convert the liquid inside of the tank back into a gas. This vaporization process is made possible by an ambient air vaporizer. Traveling through the gas use circuit, the product goes through this vaporizer before reaching its final end use application. When the economizer circuit is open, a mixture of liquid from the bottom of the tank and vapor from the top is drawn into the final vaporizer before reaching the customer. Withdrawing from the vapor phase of the tank creates the opportunity to quickly correct any pressure issues that may occur. Ambient air vaporization is the key component of any tank serving a gaseous application, ensuring the customer is provided a usable product every time. Besides gaseous applications, cryogenic fluids are often used in the liquid phase. Liquid hydrogen and oxygen are used as rocket fuel. Liquid nitrogen is used for food freezing. 
and all forms of cryogenic liquids are pumped to high pressures for gas cylinder filling. As liquid gets removed, the vapor at the top of the tank expands to accommodate for the missing liquid volume. If this were to continue until the pressure of the tank dropped below the liquid saturation pressure, flash boiling would occur. When the liquid is actually being pumped out of the tank, it must remain in a liquid state. When conditions cause a liquid to boil inside of a pump, severe damage to the equipment is likely to occur. This event is known as cavitation and is avoided by ensuring a subcool is maintained on your product. To prevent any phase change in the fluid, we must maintain a proper subcool in the liquid during this process. The subcool allows the liquid a certain capacity to absorb some heat and lose some pressure without boiling. We've now covered the basics of filling, maintaining, and emptying our cryogenic storage tanks. But what happens when there are unplanned heat loads on a tank? This is addressed by the relief circuits. These circuits are designed to protect the structural integrity of the tank during any upsets to the insulation system, fire emergencies, or overfilling. If a large quantity of heat enters the tank, the fluid begins to boil. When this boiling occurs, the pressure rises and the relief system is activated. Let's recap the stages of the cryogenic journey our liquefied product underwent. First, we filled our tank with the fluid and measured its liquid level. Then, once filling was completed, we emphasized the importance of maintaining proper heat and pressure conditions inside the tank. We discussed methods of insulation, NER, and excessive heat energy. We went over the gaseous and liquid applications for our product and the process of removing each from the tank. Lastly, we reviewed the basic safety devices used to prevent overpressurization in an upset condition. We have discussed many topics involved with cryogenic equipment, as well as the thermodynamic concepts that make it all possible. Whether you deal with the design and operation of cryogenic equipment, or if you are just curious as to how the equipment works, we hope this presentation has helped to explain what goes on behind the vacuum jacket wall. While cryogenic science fiction will continue to entertain, cryogenic science facts make our lives better every day. From developing cleaner energy solutions to carbonating a glass of pop at your local restaurant, cryogenics plays a part in all of our lives.